Hello everyone. The Easter Triduum is the culmination of the entire liturgical year. It is celebrated as one feast, Passion, Death and Resurrection of Christ. It begins with the evening Mass of the Lord's Supper and reaches its high point in the Easter Vigil. Lent, technically speaking, ends on Holy Thursday morning and then the Triduum begins with Holy Thursday. Now, in ancient times, public penitents were reconciled with the church on this day. They were publicly absolved of their sins by the bishops so they could fully celebrate the Pasch. Two Masses are celebrated on this day, one in the Cathedral Church of the Diocese and the other, the Mass of the Lord's Supper in the evening in parish churches. The morning Mass, that's the Chrism Mass, takes place in the cathedral where all the priests of the diocese are gathered round their bishop. The holy oils, which will be used throughout the year for baptism, confirmation and anointing of the sick, are consecrated at this Mass. Each parish receives its own supply. The bishop celebrating Mass with his priests is a sign of unity and fellowship. The faithful also attend in large numbers. <coughs> All the sacraments, especially those at which oil is used, have a connection with Easter. Priests, on the day they celebrate the gift of their priesthood and they renew their commitment to God on Holy Thursday. They are anointed with the power of the Spirit to bring good news to the poor. To priests alone is the power given to remit sins and change the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood. On this day, the bishop asked the laity to pray for him and his priests. The oils blessed on that day are chrism, which is used at baptism, confirmation and ordination, oil of catechumens used at baptism, or sometimes known as baptismal oil, and then, of course, the oil of the sick and the dying. In the evening, then, we have the Mass of the Lord's Supper. The Eucharist is meant to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again. It is, as the Vatican II documents say, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity. It was in the context of a family meal in which Christ instituted the Eucharist. A spirit of joy characterises the Mass, the joy of total self-sacrifice. The Gloria, silent during Lent, is sung accompanied by the sound of bells. The Mass anticipates his self-oblation on Good Friday. In the first reading, we see that Jesus was the fulfilment of the Old Testament figures, that he was the true Lamb slain in sacrifice, whose blood would save his people. The second re the, another reading gives us St. Paul's account of the Last Supper, and the Gospel describes the washing of the disciples' feet. It embodies the theme of fraternal love and service. The words of the Gospel are enforced by symbolic action. Jesus asked the apostles to copy what he has done, humble service to one another. Jesus says, Love one another as I have loved you. During the Mass, some people come forward to have their feet washed. Christ is the servant par excellence. He gave his life as a ransom for many. And that includes you and me. After Mass, the priest, accompanied by ministers, carries the Blessed Sacrament to the altar of repose. The faithful are encouraged to continue in adoration until midnight. Here we join our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. We keep watch with him in prayer. The sanctuary is now left completely bare. Good Friday is a day of intense sorrow. Our sins have been the cause of his death and the celebration takes place about three o'clock in the afternoon. For the liturgy of the word, the priests and ministers approach the altar in silence and prostrate themselves for a few moments. 
Then there's an opening prayer followed by the liturgy of the word. The first reading is from Isaiah and he presents us with a suffering servant. Now he is seen as prefiguring Christ. Christ was the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and humiliation. In the second reading from the Hebrews, Christ is seen in a priestly role as reconciling men to God by the sacrifice of his own life. Christ had experienced our human lot in every way. He can therefore sympathise with us in our sorrow and indeed in our wretchedness. Now, for the Passion of Christ, John views the Passion of Jesus more profoundly than the other evangelists in the light of the resurrection. In itself, the cross is something cruel and barbarous, but in John it is seen as an object of veneration. However, his sufferings are not minimised. For St. John, the cross is a kind of throne. It is Christ, not his persecutors, who are in control of the situation. Jesus freely goes to his execution. In John, Jesus appears in a threefold role as king, judge and saviour. The crowning with thorns only serves to undermine his kingship. So also it is Jesus, not Pilate, who is seen as the judge. Jesus gathers round the church. Jesus gathers his church round the cross as represented by the robe and Mary is given to us as our mother. Now for the general intercessions this prayer is truly universal. It concludes all categor it includes all categories of people. Christian people everywhere are gathered round the cross of Christ. His prayer is extended to all because his love excluded no one. The cross is the Christian symbol and it's a symbol of universality. Its four corners point to the four corners of the world. Prayers include those of the, for the Jewish people, those who do not believe in Christ, those who do not believe in God. Christians form only a small part of the world's population. The church is indeed a little flock. The summons to preach the gospel, therefore, is urgent. One of the great problems of today is atheism. The Pope has recently called for prayers for the re-evangelization of Europe. Last of all, the church prays for the sick, dying, travellers and prisoners. And now we come to the adoration of the cross. The Mass is not said on Good Friday. Today the church's gaze is fixed on Calvary where Christ offered his life for our salvation. Standing at the altar or as he processes up the church, the priest uncovers the upper part of the cross and sings, Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. The people respond, Come, let us adore. This is sung three times as each section of the cross is unveiled. And the cross is now placed in a position at the entrance to the sanctuary so that all the people can venerate it by kissing it or genuflecting before it. And as the people do this, the reproach, reproaches are sung. The custom of kissing the cross goes back to the 4th century. In the reproaches, Christ is reproaching his people for their ingratitude. My people, what have I done to you? The choir may also sing the Pange Lingua. This hymn has been likened to a victory march, Christ's victory over Satan. The cross is the stepping stone to glory, according to St. Leo the Great. And St. Paul says, was it not necessary that Christ should suffer and so enter into his glory? Now follows Holy Communion. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we are proclaiming his death. 
Today we are united with Christ in a special, special way because he died for love of us. Then, after communion, the liturgy comes to an abrupt end. The priest departs in silence. The church keeps vigil at the tomb of the Lord. No other day of the year are our churches so austere in appearance. The tabernacle is empty and the sanctuary devoid of flowers. Only the crucifix remains on the altar. Thank you all now for listening and God bless you all. Oh